tonight, we're fortunate to have two featured speakers from ATA Scientific Advisory Committee, Dr. Mark Minnemeyer and Dr. Jay Piccarillo, who have joined us from Little Rock, Arkansas and St. Louis, Missouri, to talk about an area of research they have both been working on. And that area is repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. You will hear us all refer to it as RTMS. We also have Melissa Dupree, an ATA member, who will share her story about her journey with tinnitus, and Jody Asmus and Jennifer Bourne with us from the ATA staff, who will be talking about ATA and helping to facilitate the webinar tonight. So whether they're in the video or the behind the scenes, we want to thank each of them for donating their time and spending the time and night with us. But before we begin, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items as well as direct you to some of the functions you may be asked to use during the course of the webinar on your control panel. During the webinar, you will be asked to answer a poll. To answer the question, simply click your answer with your mouse or using your touch screen. If you're on the telephone, of course, you will not be able to answer these questions, but answer them in your mind if you wish. If at any time you lose the audio connection through your speakers, please use the dial-in information provided in the email you received. If you lose both audio and video connection, just click the link you use to join the webinar to rejoin at any time. If you experience any other technical difficulties related to joining the webinar, please contact Citrix Customer Support at 1-888-646-0014. Again, if you're on the phone and you can't get in on the webinar, call 1-888-646-0014. At the end of the formal program, there will be an opportunity for a question and answer period. This is oftentimes the most popular part or a big popular part. If you would like to submit a question, please use the question feature in the control panel. Due to limited time, we will not have an opportunity to answer everyone's question, but please do submit. We may be able to use the questions in future webinars or in the Q&A column in our magazine, Tinnitus Today. So please, participate. I would also like to address you to some of the features in the control panel. You are in control of how you view the webinar. You have the ability to make the presentation a full screen or not. So just simply look at the little notch at the bottom of the video portion. You can place your cursor there and pull it down and you can enlarge the speaker to view them full screen. Or you can enlarge the full screens by dragging the corners of the entire presentation so that you can enlarge the whole presentation. If there are slides showing, the video view will automatically reduce the speaker at the top of the slide so that you can see the slides. If you uh, please take a moment to familiarize yourself with these features, they will come in handy as the program progresses. Now, before we get to Dr. Minnemeyer's presentation on RTMS, I'd like to introduce you to Jennifer Bourne, ATA's Program Director. Jennifer has been with ATA since 2006 and has worked for the organization in various capacities, including as editor of Tinnitus Today. She graduated from Hofstra University in Long Island, New York, with a degree in communications in 2003. And her professional background includes public relations and public policy. She brings a wealth of knowledge about ATA's history and programs. With that, I'd like to turn the program over to Jennifer to tell you a little bit more about ATA. Jennifer? Thank you, Melanie. And thank you all for joining us here this evening. Before I begin, I'd like to take a quick poll of the audience. You'll see the poll appear on your screen in just a moment. And the question is, how do you say tinnitus? Do you say tinnitus or do you say tinnitus? And while everybody's locking in their vote, I'll tell you that whichever way you say it, you are correct. The reason I bring this up is because tonight, you will hear it both ways. Uh, most patients and lay people like myself 
will say tinnitus, and most clinicians and researchers will refer to it as tinnitus. Now, the reason for this is because the itis implies inflammation, and with tinnitus, there is no inflammation that we know of. However, because APA was founded as an organization to serve the patient community, we are mostly referred to in the public as the American Tinnitus Association. And you'll see it's about half and half. Um, those are the results of the poll, so um, we're all correct. Okay, anyway, back to APA. Uh, APA was founded in 1971 by two doctors, Jack Vernon and Charles Eunice. Charles was suffering from tinnitus, and Jack was one of the few people conducting tinnitus research at the time. Like many people with tinnitus, Charles was really motivated to find something that could help him get rid of this ringing in his ears. When he found out about Jack's research, he called him up and he asked him if he could help him. Jack was just getting started, and he unfortunately didn't have anything tangible to tell him, but he told him that he would keep him uh, informed of the progress of his studies, and they hung up the phone. A week later, Charles showed up at Jack's door. Jack didn't know what to do with him, uh, but he figured since he had come all that way from California to Oregon that he could at least take him to lunch. So a few of his colleagues did just that. Now, if any of you have ever been to the downtown Portland area, you will know that there are many water fountains, decorative fountains, throughout the city. The restaurant that Jack took Charles to just happened to have one of these water fountains just outside the door. As they were walking into the restaurant, Jack noticed that Charles was no longer with the group. He turned around and he saw him standing next to the running water. Jack went over to see if he was okay. And Charles stood there with a look of shock and awe on his face. He told Jack, standing here next to this running water, this is the first time that I have not heard my tinnitus since it began. It was at that moment that Jack had an aha moment. This chance encounter between these two individuals and a little know-how on Jack's end led to the first clinically based sound therapy that we all know as masking. It also led to the creation of the American Tinnitus Association. They both knew that there was a great need for all people with tinnitus to get the help that they needed, to learn more about their condition, and most importantly, to continue to conduct research to better understand this condition. These core principles, education, research, support, and eventually advocacy were part of what APA set out to do from the very beginning, and they remain the core of our efforts to this day. A little later in the program, I'll tell you a little bit about APA's rich funding of research history. But right now, I'd like to turn the program back over to Melanie to introduce our first featured guest. Melanie, back to you. Thank you, Jennifer, for that brief history on ATA's beginnings and for explaining a bit about ATA's mission to our audience. Now I'd like to turn your attention to the main event. Our speaker is Dr. Mark Minnemeyer. Dr. Minnemeyer has been a member of ATA's Scientific Advisory Committee since 2013 and is a professor of neurobiology and developmental science at the University of Arkansas for Medical Services. Excuse me, Medical Sciences. There, he is a director of the TMS Core Research Facility in the Center for Translational Neuroscience, where he serves as a mentor to faculty and students whose projects use the core. Dr. Minnemeyer has been instrumental in developing RTMS interventions for both tinnitus and addictive disor disorders. In, a, in addition to ATA's Scientific Advisory Committee, he serves on a variety of other scientific review committees for projects concerning tinnitus, including the Department of Defense, the DOD, and National Institutes of Health, the NIH. With pleasure, I introduce to you Dr. Mark Minnemeyer to talk about his research on repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation for tinnitus. Uh, thank you, Melanie, for that introduction. 
Um, it's great to be here, and it's great to be part of the ATA's first webinar. As you mentioned, tonight's topic is repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. And sometimes I'll say RTMS or TMS for short. I've had a lot of experience with brain stimulation. I started a brain stimulation laboratory in 2004 at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. I was working with a colleague named John Dornhofer at the time. John's a neurotologist who has had a long-standing interest in tinnitus, and he had just returned from a meeting in Austria where he learned about the use of TMS for tinnitus. A lot of the original work in this area began in labs in Germany, in Germany, and a lot of the continued work in this area has occurred in European labs. So John and I were literally standing in the hospital parking garage when we decided to do our first clinical study. And at the time, um, we were funded by several uh, agencies that I want to acknowledge. Um, we received our first funding for research from a COBRA grant that was awarded to the University of Arkansas for Medical, Sci uh, Medical Sciences, and COBRA stands for a Center of Biomedical Research Excellence. We've also been funded by the Tinnitus Research Consortium, and then we've been funded by the National Institute of Deafness and Communication Disorders, and our laboratory is currently funded by the National Institute of General Medical Sciences. Finally, we received pilot study money from the National Institute of Health Clinical Science and Translation Award, a CTSA grant, to um, the Translational Research Institute at UAMS. So I want to acknowledge these funding agencies because the information I'm giving you tonight would not be possible in large part if it were not for the generosity of, and support of these agencies. Okay, so what exactly is TMS? Well, TMS is a non-invasive form of brain stimulation, and non-invasive means that the stimulation is coming from outside of the body. During TMS, as shown in the slide, a coil is head held over the scalp and skull, which covers the brain, and an electrical charge is um, discharged through the coil. A magnetic field is created beneath the, the stimulating coil, and when this magnetic field enters the medium of the brain, it creates an electrical current that has the potential for activating neurons um, beneath the coil. TMS is also <clears throat> um, delivered in pulses, and these pulses are very brief, but they can be repeated rather rapidly in most treatments between 1 and 25 times per second. And um, this is the, the notion of repetitive transcranial magnetic simulation. In addition, the intensity of this magnetic field can be adjusted from very low levels to higher levels. So you may be wondering then, how do we use TMS for tinnitus? Well, here's our understanding of how TMS works. So beneath the coil, each TMS pulse has potential for activating neurons. And in most types of TMS studies, the goal is to repeatedly stimulate an area of the brain um, for you know, anywhere from between 15 to 30 minutes. We stimulate auditory regions of the brain as shown in this slide um, because we know from previous studies that this type of stimulation has potential for reducing tinnitus perception. We also assume that it's possible by stimulating this region of the brain, it's possible to activate other regions of the brain that share anatomical connections with the stimulated site. Um, so TMS is probably affecting more than one brain region, even though the stimulation is applied locally in one brain region. Um, for example, this slide shows um, our side of stimulation, auditory cortex, which shares anatomical connections with frontal cortex, and it shares anatomical connections with other parts of the brain that mediate emotional reactions to sound. The adjacent slide shows many, some of the many um, anatomical connections between these regions. So TMS, again, is probably affecting more than one brain region. And this is an important point because the behavioral effect we see of TMS is also multifaceted. For example, um, TMS may not only influence the loudness of tinnitus perception, but it may also influence one's awareness or annoyance or bother of tinnitus as well. So it appears that auditory stimulation can have a widespread of
that's specifically used um, for tinnitus? Well, there are really a variety of ways that this is done. Uh, the best tested approach is applying low-frequency TMS over auditory cortex. This slide basically shows our setup in the lab where we have a TMS coil that's centered over auditory cortex during stimulus delivery. Um, this approach was originally used because investigators believed that auditory cortex was hyperexcited in patients with tinnitus. And the logic was that by applying a low frequency of repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, we could inhibit this excitability. And in fact, that turned out to be true. However, the hypothesis may not actually be correct because subsequent studies showed that both high and low frequencies of TMS could have a similar beneficial effect for many patients with tinnitus. In addition, other studies have showed that stimulating the frontal cortex could be beneficial for tinnitus or stimulating frontal cortex in combination with temporal cortex stimulation. So um, the best explanation might be that RTMS influences interconnected brain systems and that it's possible to stimulate these systems at multiple sites in the brain. Perhaps the most important question is, how does RTMS influence tinnitus perception? And again, um, this may occur in several ways. One of the problems in answering this question is that not all studies have used the same outcome measures when they're investigating the effects of TMS on tinnitus. Um, for example, some studies use questionnaires like the Tinnitus Functional Index or the Tinnitus Handicap Inventory. And these questionnaires give you information about how tinnitus affects a person in their, in their life. Um, other studies have used targeted measures of tinnitus loudness, awareness, annoyance, or bother in order to assess how TMS affects tinnitus perception at any given moment. And our studies have focused more on the latter type of, of ratings. And we've learned um, some interesting things. For example, we've learned that many patients with tinnitus report a decrease of awareness in their tinnitus um, before any change in their loudness of tinnitus or their annoyance of tinnitus ratings. And this, uh, this intriguing finding suggests to us that TMS may actually help patients ignore their tinnitus um, by becoming more accustomed to it or by not paying so much attention to it. So that's a kind of exciting finding for us. When someone benefits from TMS, the beneficial effect can last for weeks or even months after stimulation stops. For, re, for example, a recent important study was conducted at the Portland VA and the Oregon Health Sciences um, University um, that used the tinnitus functional index to measure change in patients following low-frequency TMS stimulation of auditory cortex. And this study found that in patients who responded positively to treatment, that effect could last for months after the stimulation ended. However, not all patients respond to TMS in the same way. Um, I think the studies show that about 50% of patients may have a positive response to TMS and another 50% may have no response at all. Um, this has actually been a major problem for the clinical trials which been, have been conducted to investigate efficacy. For example, if you knew in advance that only half of your subjects were going to respond to TMS and you, and you tested a, only a small sample of subjects, you might erroneously conclude that TMS doesn't have any effect on tinnitus when I think it's more accurate to say that TMS can work quite well in a subset of patients, and the more important question is to learn which subset of patients benefit and how they benefit. Um, unfortunately, it's not clear at this point um, how some people respond to TMS and how some people fail that type of treatment, but this outcome isn't really applicable only to TMS and tinnitus. Most types of medical treatments have treatment responders and non-responders, and most medications have treatment responders and non-responders. Clearly, what's needed at this point is a much larger scale investigation with multiple test sites and large numbers of patients to really answer the question of the efficacy about the efficacy of TMS. So some of you are probably wondering if you're a good candidate for this type of treatment. Um, studies have shown that patients with mild to moderate tinnitus or mild to moderate hearing loss may benefit more than patients with severe tinnitus or severe hearing loss. However, this could also be true of other types of treatments for tinnitus. 
patients with mild to moderate tinnitus might simply respond better to treatment than patients with more severe tinnitus. So again, more research is really needed to flesh out these, these findings and to determine and identify you know, who's likely to respond to TMS and, and who may not respond to TMS. Presently, in our own studies, we simply have to test people to determine who has a positive response and who has a negative response. And we think that by separating patients this way, that will be the best approach for understanding how TMS actually affects tinnitus perception. Another big challenge facing this area is to learn how to extend the beneficial effect of TMS. As I mentioned, in patients who respond to TMS, tinnitus tends to return if the stimulation is merely stopped, um, and it tends to return over time. In one pilot study, we found that repeating the treatment over the course of many months could help keep tinnitus at a low chronic level in most of our treatment responders. And we're currently conducting another study to see if we can replicate that finding in a larger group of subjects. The challenge for understanding how TMS works as a therapy is not only relevant to tinnitus, but it's really relevant to every disorder for which TMS is used as a treatment. And there actually are uh, there actually is a wide application of TMS in neurologic and psychiatric disorders. Currently, TMS is only FDA approved for the treatment of depression, but it's been used um, in a wide uh, range of neurologic and psychiatric disorders, including Parkinson's disease, migraine headache, neurologic pain, auditory hallucinations and schizophrenia, and anxiety disorders, just to name some. Um, TMS is also used to understand brain connectivity, and it's also used to understand functional specialization of regions of the brain. However, our understanding of how TMS works from a mechanistic perspective is still very limited, and it's important to investigate this in order to learn how TMS is actually affecting symptom perception. And clearly, again, more research is needed to kind of understand this phenomenon. Well, that really brings me to the end of my talk, and I understand that there's a question and answer period at the end of the program, and I'd be happy to answer any questions I can at that time. Melanie, I'd like to turn it back to you. Well, thank you, Dr. Menemeyer, for that informative presentation. Um, I don't know about you, but I could listen to that over and over again, and I've had the opportunity to listen to it several times. So if you'd like to hear it again, we are going to be putting the link in the member section of the ATA at ata.org. So check for the website at a later date and uh, go back and listen to it and look at the slides again. Um, I know if you're like me, I would learn a lot more. So one of the single most important functions of ATA is to directly fund research. In fact, we just funded a student in this last round of grants to look more closely at some of the challenges faced by RTMS for tinnitus to further optimize the therapy. So it's really, truly exciting what kind of research is being done and in this particular field. We all look forward to the question and answer section and portion of this presentation where Dr. Menemeyer and Dr. Piccarillo will answer some of the questions that you may already have in your mind. If you've already um, typed them in, we're going to be looking at that. So stay tuned for your opportunity to ask those questions. As you may already know, all of the research that ATA funds is enabled by donations from our members, donors, and supporters. These donations come in almost entirely from individuals. By becoming an ATA member, you have a stake in the future direction of ATA research by helping ATA to directly fund this research. To tell you a little bit more about ATA's rich history of funding research, I'd like to turn the program back over to Jennifer. Jennifer? Thank you again, Melanie. Since 1980, when ATA awarded its very first research grant, we have awarded over $6 million in what we refer to as seed grants to researchers throughout the world. Our grant program consists of funding awarded to both established investigators, and to students to help further their, their own interests and studies uh, into tinnitus. 
Once the grants are received, a rigorous peer review process takes place by our esteemed scientific advisory committee, which, as evidenced tonight, are comprised of some of the best and the brightest minds working on better understanding tinnitus. Each grant is evaluated on its merits and ability to push science forward. It also must fall into one or more paths on ATA's roadmap to a cure, a document that was created by our scientific advisory committee that outlines four paths of research, two basic and two clinical. Once the grants are scored, they are then forwarded to our board of directors for funding considerations. As Melanie mentioned, all of ATA's ability to fund research comes directly from individuals, our members, our donors, and supporters. And that is something that each and every ATA member can and should be proud of. Another way that ATA has helped push science forward and to increase funding for research is through our advocacy efforts. Over the past decade, ATA has been successful in increasing federal funding for tinnitus research from around $1.5 million annually in 2005 up to $10 million annually as of 2013. As a result of these efforts, the pace of research has hastened and many new discoveries are now known that were not previously known. Many of you in the audience tonight are ATA members. So I'd just like to say thank you. We could not do this important work without your support and contribution. I look forward, and we all look forward, to continuing to work with you over the course of the next few years to work towards a future without tinnitus. Melanie, I'd like to turn the program back over to you to introduce our next speaker. Well, thank you, Jennifer, for the particulars on ATA's programs. It is true that our members are and have always been the backbone of this organization, and that is why ATA is presenting these webinars every two months. Look for the announcement on the January webinar on the website or via email. These webinars are a member benefit, and you are the ATA, so I extend my thanks to each of you. Now, we turn our attention back to RTMS for another enlightening presentation from Dr. Jay Piccarillo. Dr. Piccarillo, a practicing clinical otolaryngologist and professor of otolaryngology, medicine, biostatistics, and occupational therapy at Washington University in St. Louis. He has been a member of ATA's Scientific Advisory Committee since 2008. He has been an ATA grant recipient as well as conducted a variety of NIH clinical research projects on tinnitus. Dr. Piccarillo is on the Executive and Operations Committee of the Clinical Translation Science Awards Program at Washington University, which is designed to facilitate discoveries in clinical research and to speed the translation of basic research findings into improved prevention from a clinical trial he has done on RTMS for tinnitus. Dr. Piccarillo, I turn the program over to you. Great. Thank you, Melanie. It's good to be here with all of you tonight, and like my colleague, Dr. Minimar. Dr. Piccarillo, I'm going to suggest you turn the, um, the camera on because we want to see you at the same time we see these slides. We can definitely see the slides. There you go. All right. Thank you so much. want to make sure we catch everything. Thank you, Melanie. I apologize for that technical problem. Well, again, it's good to be here and to share with you some of the research that I've been doing. Like my colleague, Dr. Minermeyer, I've been involved with tinnitus research for a number of years, approximately 15. I got... Uh, involved because I realized that a large number of my patients suffer with this condition and there just seemed to be so little that I could really offer them. And 
So in addition to some of the new developments in neuroimaging and, and pharmacology, it really seemed like a, a great time to get started in tinnitus research. Um, so um, I, I uh, really also want to take this opportunity, like Dr. Minnemeyer, to thank the funding agencies like the National Institutes of Health and the APA for all their uh, support for research that uh, is done in this area. And so let me start with um, my slides here. Great. So um, I'll start about discussing neuroimaging research, and I'd like to describe some of the exciting research that's been uh, done in neuroimaging, especially here at Washington University as well as elsewhere. Um, magnetic resonant imaging, or MRI, is based on the concept that the blood contains oxygen, and that oxygen um, gets replenished every time we bleed, uh, breathe in. So there's oxygenated blood, and then we also have deoxygenated blood. And that this oxygenated and deoxygenated blood produces a different MRI signal. And this difference in the spontaneous MRI signal, due to the differences in the blood oxygen while the brain is at rest, allows us to study the brain activity. So spontaneous bold or blood oxygen level dependent activity um, looks at the brain at rest and looks for temporal correlations. That means correlations over time as a marker for areas of the brain that are connected. And this animation created below by one of my colleagues illustrates this what we call seed method for identifying regions that are related by the way that they fluctuate simultaneously. So here we see the first animation, various areas of the brain sending out a signal related to how much oxygen they're using. We then define a seed region, that means a particular area of the brain that we're interested in, shown here in the yellow donut. And we ask the question, what other areas of the brain are using oxygen at the same level as this seed region? And that then becomes the correlated area shown here in purple. So this is how we use blood oxygenation at rest to identify areas of the brain that are related. So here we show um, the correlation between the bold signal, the blood oxygen level signal, and two areas of the brain referred to as the interparietal sulcus here and the frontal eye field here and shown on the brain. And all these red dots represent the actual blood oxygenation level or brain activity between these two areas. And that is then transferred into a statistic called the Pearson's correlation with this black line to show that these two areas, the interparietal sulcus and the frontal eye field, are strongly correlated and strongly related in their activity. In this slide, I show another region of the brain, the posterior cingulate, and that's shown in this seed area right here, this green dot. We show the correlation of blood oxygen level in the cingulate with other areas of the brain shown by these different colors. And cool colors show uh, relationships in an inverse relationship, and cool colors, the red and yellows, are positive correlations. So neuroimaging studies conducted at Washington University by my colleagues have identified significant abnormalities in the cortical neural networks responsible for attention, cognition, and memory in patients with bothersome tinnitus. And similar abnormalities have not been observed in non-bothered tinnitus patients. In this slide, I show the brain the cut brains of patients who do not have tinnitus. We call them controls. And we show um, the air area of the auditory region is right down in here on each of these images. And we see that there is strong correlation, as shown by this bright yellow, in blood oxygen level with the auditory center. And there's actual inverse correlation shown by the cool blue with the auditory center in blood oxygenation levels among controls. I now show you what the brains look like and blood oxygenation looks like for the tinnitus patients, shown in these four cuts down here. 
And again, we're looking at blood oxygen level as it activity as it relates to the activity in the auditory center. And you can see in the tinnitus patients, there's cool colors up in here. But what is strikingly different, if you look down here, this is in the back of the brain or the occipital or the visual part of the brain, where this inverse correlation is shown by the blue, which is not seen up here in the control patients. And in addition, you see a much broader area of positive correlation in the tinnitus patients, which is absent in the control patients. So we conducted the same type of functional connectivity MRI studies on 18 non-bothered tinnitus patients and compared them with um, the non-tinnitus controls. And we found, um, um, we, the analysis, I'm sorry, was done in 18 non-bothered controls. And what we found was no disassociations between any of the 58 regions or seeds of the brain that we analyzed. That is, the non-bothered tinnitus brains used oxygen at really the same activity level, the same relationship as the control brains. So since that publication, approximately 12 years, uh, I'm sorry, since, since the first publication um, of the use of RTMS for tinnitus approximately 12 years ago, there have been a large number of studies um, that have examined the impact of low and high frequency RTMS. And that, um, again, this whole idea of dysfunctional networks has been very, very important. We know about the differential involvement and severity uh, dysfunction across different networks may help explain this well-known diversity in tinnitus symptoms across different subsets of patients. Different patients describe different problems, and we think that's related to the various areas of the brain that may be involved. So as a result of the findings from the neuroimaging and various brain electrical signal research, we believe the focus of tinnitus research has clearly shifted from focusing on the periphery, that is the ear, to more of the central nervous system, and that there's a now top-down attention system composed of different subunits, including the frontal parietal system and the dorsal lateral, that are involved in tinnitus. The um, attention network uh, is defined, as I mentioned, by this frontal parietal system, and it's viewed as supporting executive control or decision-making, the ability of the brain to exert control over which of the many available sensory inputs should be processed. The second part is the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, which is a promising area for treatment in bothersome tinnitus because it seems to be involved in tasks of attention and control and it has extensive interconnections with other areas of the brain, including the medial thalamus, the amygdala, if you will, the emotional parts of the brain. So involvement of the prefrontal, the right prefrontal cortex alone appears to be of particular importance in mediating the effective components of tinnitus. What I'd now like to do is uh, change my attention, if you will, to the discussion of the clinical efficacy of RTMS, the focus of tonight's discussion. So uh, the first publication of the use of RTMS or tinnitus occurred approximately 12 years ago, and um, there have now been a large number of studies examining the impact of low and high frequency RTMS for tinnitus. And although some studies have shown improvement of tinnitus severity and lasting duration, other studies have not found improvement. And when an overall average is calculated from the results in individual patients um, based on the small sample size of these studies, authors conclude that RTMS does not work. And the key point is to emphasize that it is important that more studies of RTMS be completed so as to help us understand why some patients respond and others do not. And I'm echoing what Dr. Minnemeyer said earlier. At Washington University, I've performed two trials of the use of RTMS for tinnitus. One of them was two weeks in duration and the other four weeks. Both enrolled 14 patients and found overall no differences in improvement in tinnitus severity between the active RTMS group and the placebo stimulation group. However, we did have some positive responders 
in the trial, which I'll discuss shortly. But first, I'd like to share with you a video clip demonstrating the actual RTMS on patients. So this is a patient in the RTMS trial with the RTMS device, the magnet shown here, placed against his scalp. And what I'd like you to do is watch the video and listen for the click, click, click. That's the sound of the magnet as it's delivering the RTMS energy. Okay, here we go. Here comes the tennis. And so that's a train of the magnetic stimulation. It's like a tap, 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 tap on the, on the head. And underneath is the electrical current. And you're going to hear another train, and that gives you an idea of what it's like. And the patient sits there for about 45 minutes for each session. As you can see, the patient really doesn't feel much pain or looks bothered. In fact, several of our patients would actually take that opportunity, the 45 minutes, to catch up on a nap. Let me share with you two of my patient's stories. Um, for one subject, um, his, a correctional officer, his initial complaint of his tinnitus was that it interfered with his ability to concentrate. And in his job as a correctional officer, he frequently was required to write down the seven-digit inmate number located on their shirt as they move the inmates around the correctional facility. Before RTMS, he had to look at the number several times to correctly write the number. But after two weeks of RTMS, he described the ability to view the number on the inmate shirt and be able to transcribe the entire seven numbers without having to look up again. So his improvement was short, improvement in short-term memory. The second story is a woman who had been unable to sleep through the night for years as a result of her intrusive tinnitus. After two weeks of RTMS, she was able to sleep through the night. Her husband, unaccustomed to finding her in bed with him in the morning, began to shake her violently that first morning for fear that she had died, and that explained why she still was in bed with him that morning. So our conclusion um, from the two studies is, um, and based on brains, is that um, RTMS really does seem to have an effect on some of our patients. Let me talk about a study that Dr. Mittermeier alluded to. It's a recent study that was published, and it's a positive study about the results of RTMS. It demonstrated, um, it, excuse me, it enrolled 64 patients who received either active low-frequency or placebo RTMS on 10 consecutive workdays. 18 of the 32 participants, or approximately 56% in the active RTMS group, and 7 out of 32, or about 22% in the placebo RTMS group, were responders. And interestingly, improvements in tinnitus severity experienced by the responders were sustained during the 26-week follow-up period. That was quite impressive. So what are the current challenges and opportunities related to the use of RTMS for tinnitus? I would argue, and I think Dr. Minnemeyer and I feel very strongly about this and talk about it at our national meetings, that there's a variety of methodological issues with these studies of RTMS and tinnitus, such as small sample size, inadequate use of the placebo, variability in patient inclusion and exclusion criteria, different stimulation sites and parameters, and differences in outcome measures all undermine the validity of the results from individual studies and the ability to combine the results across studies. <clears throat> the situation today remains as it was in 2006 when one of the key tinnitus researchers wrote, RTMS appears to be a very promising tool for the diagnosis and treatment of tinnitus patients. Available knowledge is still very limited at the moment. Further basic research and clinical studies are needed in order to optimize the parameters of stimulation, that is frequency, cortical uh, target definition, and to validate the application of this technique in the management of, of patients with disabling tinnitus. So what needs to be done? Well, 
we believe larger number of uh, patients need to be enrolled in prospective, randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blind studies with large sample sizes. In addition, attempts need to be made to enroll a more homogeneous group of tinnitus patients with regards to their duration of tinnitus and hearing loss and use of uniform and validated tinnitus-specific questionnaires and measurement scales. As I end my presentation, I'd like to acknowledge the grant support from the American Tinnitus Association, the National Institutes of Deafness and Other Communication Disorders, the Federal Emergency Management Association, and the Department of Defense, all of whom have contributed funds to help support my research, particularly those with RTMS. Melanie, I'd like to turn the program back to you, and thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Piccarillo, for the informative and thought-provoking presentation on the, the clinical trials you have conducted and the positive aspect that if we have research, we can go further. So you, what you have learned as a result is extremely important. So clearly, there is more work to be done on RTMS, but it remains a promising area of therapy for tinnitus. We've learned so much this evening about important research that is helping push science forward towards new treatments for tinnitus. But now I'd like us to switch gears a little bit, and I want you to hear from an ATA member, someone who has been through the trials of tinnitus and who has come through on the other side. For some people with tinnitus, they still haven't found a treatment or therapy that works for them, and that's why ATA continues to fund research toward new treatments and cures. But there are some who have, and with that, I'd like to introduce Melissa Dupree, an ATA member, volunteer, and a dear friend who is here to share her personal tinnitus story with all of you. Melissa? Thank you, Melanie. Thank you very much, and good evening, audience. Um, I, I've been very sick with a cold for about a week, and this was about five years ago, and I kept hearing a buzzing sound in my left ear on and off. Uh, I thought for sure it would subside, but it continued and didn't stop. Uh, when this hissing sound started, I knew immediately what it was. My sister-in-law had a terrible battle with tinnitus and hyperacusis and told me how she suffered over the years. So as soon as I realized I had the same battle in front of me, I was filled with fear. Many questions raced through my mind. How could this have happened? How could this sound have invaded my body? And perhaps most importantly, how do I rid myself of it? After several days of crying and no sleep, I decided that no matter what it took, I was going to find a solution to this nightmare. I first went to an ENT, and as many of you know uh, and have probably experienced, that was useless. He told me there was nothing I could do for my tinnitus and that I would have to learn to live with it. After that, appoint that, after that ENT appointment, I was beyond discouraged. I turned to the internet for information. I read about other tinnitus experiences which empowered me to take charge of my own situation. The internet also proved to be useful in finding a doctor who could help me in managing my tinnitus. I then found Dr. Michael Robb, an auto neurologist who treated tinnitus was located in Phoenix, where I live. I made an appointment to see Dr. Rob, who proved to not only be one of the kindest individuals I've ever met, but one of the most knowledgeable about tinnitus. He made me feel so safe and took the fear out of my tinnitus for me at that time when I really needed it. We had a thorough consultation, and he suggested that I try sound therapy to treat my tinnitus. I wore earbuds every day for eight months, and, and despite my initial reaction to wearing them, they did not interfere in my life at all. The treatment worked. But let me be clear in telling you that I still hear my tinnitus every day. However, I'm free from anxiousness, fear, and desperation that it made me feel. The sound therapy <clears throat> helped desensitize me to it. 
Um, I have learned to live with my tinnitus, but in a strategic and a clinical-based way. Not just by someone telling me, learn to live with it. Today, those dark days when I first got tinnitus are all behind me. I'm stronger than I've ever been, and I couldn't be happier. And even though I still hear my tinnitus, I'm not bothered by it and continue to enjoy doing all the things that I have always loved. If there's one thing you take away from my story is to never give up and hope that something can and will help you manage your tinnitus. My mission statement is, someday your pain will become your source of strength. Face it, brave it, and you will make it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Melissa, for that hopeful account of your journey with tinnitus. I know that there are many people in attendance tonight who truly appreciate your optimism and for sharing your personal experience. Many of us have been down that road and understand far too much. And now it's time for the question and answer portion of the evening. I know this is probably a time you've waited for. So we'll try to get in as many answers as we can. I'm going to ask all of the uh, participants to come up on video. We'll only turn our uh, microphones on when you speak and, and are answering a question, but we'd like to um, also acknowledge all of the various ones. Jennifer, now there's Jody Asmus. She also works at ATA, and she's been working all of the uh, functions behind the scenes for us. And of course, you met Melissa and Dr. Minnemeyer and Dr. Piccarillo. So, um, we are going to bring up a few of the speakers, and then we're going to have a brief question. We're going to ask each one to answer it as quickly as you can, and then if we need more extensive answers, we'll answer these in tinnitus today or in another form at another webinar. Um, here's the first question, and we're just going to go with what's been asked by, by you, the member. I have had tinnitus for 10 years. I've tried sound therapy, but it did not work for me. Are there any current clinical trials going on for RTMS that I could participate? If not, do you have any suggestions about what other exciting or experimental therapies that are out there that I could try? Dr. Piccarillo, could we start with you? Sure, thank you. Um, as far as active clinical trials with RTMS, I'm not aware of any right now. Um, open to the general public, the VA hospital, the one that conducted the study I talked about, the positive study, uh, may be recruiting, but that would be veterans only, not open to the general public. So um, at this point, no, I wouldn't say there's any clinical trials of RTMS. There are some practitioners who may be doing it as a clinical service. Um, but So other exciting uh, treatments, we've been doing a lot with stress reduction, using mindfulness-based stress reduction for our patients with tinnitus. As well as we've had some um, ex uh, really positive experience with computer-based br brain training programs, the kind of things that you see advertised on the TV to help improve memory, perception, and cognition. Great. Thank you, Dr. Piccarillo. Um, Dr. Minnemeyer, would you like to respond to that question? Um, I get asked this question all the time in emails, and um, you know, we actually have a clinical trial with RTMS that's kind of completing right now, so we're not really enrolling uh, a lot of subjects in that, that clinical trial, and that's unfortunately the news I have to give all these people who email me and want, you know, want to try to get into the study. Um, if you're trying to look for a clinical trial that uses some form of brain stimulation or TMS, um, if you go to the clinicaltrials.gov website and search under tinnitus, you may have some luck finding something in your area. Almost any device study would be registered in clinicaltrials.gov, and any funded clinical trial for tinnitus should probably be registered in, in clinicaltrials.gov as well. So that might be a resource for people who are looking. But I really do get asked this question all the time, and you know, uh, it's you know, we we have we do our studies when when we can be funded on those studies and when we can support the research. So. Um, that in, in and of itself is a full-time job trying to, to, you know, keep these studies going. So I sure. would and clinicaltrials.gov as a resource. Okay. Well, thank you. That's what we need, our new resources. And uh, here's another question that was asked. Is RTMS covered by insurance? Dr. Piccarillo? 
Well, RTMS for um, depression is, but I don't think it is for tinnitus. Okay, Dr. Minnemeyer? Uh, yes, that's my understanding too. I think Jay is correct that um, there actually are, you know, codes for RTMS treatment um, for tinnitus that are billable codes, um, but that does not exist for tinnitus, and mostly because we don't have FDA approval for the treatment of tinnitus or for that indication. Well, and that brings us to another question that was asked. I mean, how long do you think it would take to get FDA approval for tinnitus? Um, so. It would take, I mean, it would have to occur in stages, and I think that um, there are phase two and phase three stages of these research projects that have to be completed. So the larger scale research projects would be required, multiple site trials with large numbers of subjects, basically to demonstrate efficacy for the technique. I think that's the evidence the FDA would want. And those trials um, would cost in the millions of dollars to fund. Um, and it would probably be more than one study that would be necessary um, to provide the evidence that's, that's required. So um, it would take years, you know, to, to try to um, complete this task. Um, but if you don't start, I mean, it will never be completed. So um, it would take years to do, and it would take millions of dollars to fund. Um, but that's how mo FDA approval occurs in, in lots of other instances. So it's, it's really not unusual that way. Um, and Jay, I think you had some thoughts on that as well. Well, yeah, just to agree that uh, I like your point, Mark, that if we don't get started, we'll never get there, and that um, these studies um, can be run concurrently, so you know they don't have to wait on the completion of one to another. So it's it's absolutely doable. It's absolutely doable within four or five years. It's just the funding, the money that's needed to run these trials. Okay, thank you. Well, we're getting close to the end of our scheduled hour, so we only have time for one more question, and that's going to throw us over just a minute or two. But I'm going to go ahead and ask this question, because it was one that was asked by a member. Um, and uh, it was mentioned that ATA has funded a student grant to further optimize this therapy. What exactly will the grant that ATA funded aim to do? And Jennifer, would you answer that quickly? Sure. Um, so the student grant that we funded is uh, hoping to determine the part of the brain that is most responsive to TMS. Um, it's also looking to determine the appropriate length of time for the treatment and duration and to look for the best placement of the, the magnet or the coil uh, which delivers the magnetic pulses. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll get some, some further answers on, on those areas of, of this therapy and uh, optimize it a bit further for treatment. Well, folks, our time tonight is just about up. I want to thank you all again for attending ATA's first webinar and making it a success. I truly hope you got as much out of these presentations as I have, and it is my hope that you will join us all for the next webinar, which will take place on Tuesday, January 12, 2016 same time and same place. It'll be on a Tuesday night. This webinar will be featuring Dr. Norma Mraz. She's an audiologist in Georgia who will discuss current clinical practices on tinnitus and hyperacusis management strategies, how she sees them work for patients and Dr. Grant Searchfield, PhD, from the University of Auckland in New Zealand who is also one of ATA's Scientific Advisory Committee members, who will talk about some new sound therapies that are being researched currently and the research supporting why sound therapy works. So registration will be soon, and it will be available on ATA's website at ata.org. And I also want to thank our presenters again, Dr. Mark Minnemeyer and Dr. Jay Piccarillo, for volunteering their time and expertise on RTMS and for sharing with us some of the important new frontiers they've explored.
board and what they've discovered with their research, as well as noting what future work needs to be done yet for RTMS. It's a viable therapy for tinnitus community. We are truly fortunate also to have Melissa Dupree come share with us her journey. So we want to thank her for that and for each one of you attending, Jody and Jennifer. It's been a great night. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope we will see you in 2016 at our next AGA webinar. Good night.